thank everyone involved uh, with planning this symposium and allowing me uh, to be up here to present. My name is uh, Christopher, and I'm from the Molecular Biology Department here on campus. And I've been researching the human microbiome for almost four years now. And I have to say that over this time, I've developed quite a different view of what it means to be a human being, and that's caused me to expand my definition of, of human health. I really enjoy starting these talks with an image like this. Um, it's, it's called Earthrise. It's the first color photo of the Earth ever taken, and it's regarded as one of the most influential photos ever taken. And I share this and chose this image because I think it's all about perspective. I want to get you to start thinking about um, yourselves in a different way. I want to get you in the mindset um, sort of that I've developed about human health. And that starts with this image. When you look at it, what you see is clouds. Um, you see the oceans and you might see land. But we know that beyond just what we can see with our eyes, this is a photo of our home. It's the place where, um, you know, it's, it's an incredibly complex place. It houses all three branches of life, entire ecosystems and, and the like. And I think in, in, it's easy and it's natural for us to view the earth this way. Um, but it's just as easy with, with this view of human health, taking into account the human microbiome, to start viewing the human being as more than just water and tissues paired with a personality and an immune system. So what is a microbiome? It's simply just a collective group of microbes in a given ecosystem, microbes including fungi and bacteria and viruses. As a microbiomist, I have to have my foot in the door of many disciplines, including uh, microbiology, ecology, computer biology, bioinformatics, and others. But at the end of the day, what I study is the human being as an ecosystem. Now, I can imagine you probably don't often think of yourself this way, so from this perspective, I want to show you what it takes to build a human. So we can start with human cells, uh, and, and we'll start with about one trillion of them. And for the purposes of this slide, I'm going to stay on the modest or conservative end of estimates. And so to that, uh, we have these represented with, with these colorful dots. And to that, what we're going to do is add about twice as many microbial cells, so about two trillion. So that means that our cells are outnumbered by our microbial inhabitants roughly two to one. Um, and if you stop to think about it, that's quite a lot of microbes living all over us. And there are a lot of profound implications, including the fact that each of you all sitting out here in the audience have this microbial cloud surrounding you, which is really cool. Um, and so for this next bit, I want to take sort of a, a step back, because before we can build cells, we need DNA. Um, we need genes to make proteins, to make cells, to make tissues, to make organs, to make us. And each human has about 20,000 genes, and it's difficult to see, but those are represented by A, C's, T's, and G's, the base pairs that, that form your DNA um, within our generic symbol. And as it turns out, with a microbial outnumbering of our cells, also comes a microbial outnumbering of our genes, such that when we visualize this, it's about a 20 to 1 ratio of microbial genes to human ratios, uh, excuse me, to human genes, which is incredible. Um, and these genes can influence our, our health in good ways and bad. So when you take all this together, we've built a human, we've outfitted um, the human with cells, genes, and many, many microbes. And when we reflect upon these facts and we begin to look at the finer points, we paint a clear picture that we as human beings are complex ecosystems. And the journey to this complexity for each of us begins during birth. So babies are sterile during gestation, and I put quotes around sterile because it seems to be that as technology grows and as we begin to understand more about microbiomes, everywhere that we thought there weren't microbes, it turns out we're finding that there are. With classic examples being blood and urine, those aren't sterile entities. Um, and so, the, uh, sorry. Uh, there are microbes present in the placenta, uh, but as far as we know now, uh, those aren't the first colonizers. The first colonizers of your microbiome are going to be dependent upon uh, mode of birth. So whether you're born traditionally through a sensarian section or a stork carries you through the window, um, your first contact with microbes is going to be different due to these different locations. And while we have a ways to go in understanding these relationships, it seems to be that early indications are suggesting that this can have uh, an effect on long-term health of a child. So after birth, the next microbial contact uh, and, and the next colonizers are going to come from breast milk. Um, so over you know tens of thousands of human years, uh, tens of thousands of years of human evolution, 
breast milk is basically crafted into this ultimate uh, source of nutrition for, for a newborn. It, you know, it provides nutrients and vitamins and antibodies that are going to strengthen the child's immune system and things like that, but it also contains good germs, so probiotic organisms that are going to begin to colonize all the surfaces of the body and protect it from um, infection, protect it from pathogens and, and things like that. Breast milk's also going to contain um, Prebiotics, which are things that only the germs can, uh, can utilize. Our bodies are incapable of digesting these. And so basically, it serves to keep the good germs happy and to keep them in a newborn's body so that they're protected. Um, we also know that these good germs um, and, and the second wave of colonizers from breast milk are really important in, in immune system development, training the immune system, um, strengthening the immune system, and, and things like that. And so they have all kinds of benefits for short and long-term health. The next place that, that we're going to get microbes from is the environment. Microbes are everywhere, and, and let's be honest, babies are dirty. They get into everything. But that's not such a bad thing. Um, you know, a proper immune system, as I mentioned, needs to be strengthened and trained. And, and together with the resident microbes on a child and the, the microbes in the environment, these things are going to come into play to help strengthen an immune system. The other thing to note here is that evolution plays an important role in which microbes from the environment are setting up long-lasting residents with us. As you might imagine, a soil microbe has evolved to survive in the dirt. And so when it tries to colonize our bodies, it finds a whole different set of environmental variables to deal with, including different uh, moisture levels, oxygen availability. Um, it's going to, they're going to have to fight our immune system, most likely. And in addition to that, they're going to have to compete with the, the resident microbes that are on our bodies, um, who are successful at already tolerating these factors. Remember that the body is an ecosystem. So by about one year of age, a child's microbiome has reached a stable adult light signature. Um, and, and so we know where they came from, and, but where are they now? Um, essentially, anywhere you can think of on the human body, you're going to find a microbe. Um, it's that simple. Um, the greatest concentration is within the gut, so the whole collective digestive system, the gastrointestinal tract. And we can begin to put some sort of faces um, to these locations and get an idea of who is where. And so these are just scanning electron uh, micrographs of these organisms. We have Staphylococcus is often present in our skin, nose, and ears. And that may be a shock to you when you hear Staphylococcus because you used to probably thinking of the flesh-eating MRSA and all the antibiotic resistance. And the thing is, is that by and large, most of the time, Staphylococcus are going to be beneficial or not harmful at all. Um, we also have Lactobacillus which are common probiotics, and those are going to be found primarily in the vagina. They can be found in the gut and for short periods um, in, in the mouth as well. And uh, there's also Prifermonis, which is an oral micro uh, microbe. And so you can be certain when you're exchanging a smooch with your partner that you're probably exchanging your Prifermonis with one another. We also have Escherichia coli, E. coli for short, very popular, often maligned in the popular press. Um, as the, is the case with Staphylococcus, most of these organisms aren't harmful and some are, in, are, are actually beneficial for us. And those will be found within your gut. Um, so we also have Helicobacter pylori, which is a common cause of gastric ulcers. And that one is often pathogenic when it's found in your body. And we find that in the stomach, obviously. It can tolerate very low pH, which is uh, why it survives so well in that niche. Pseudomonas is another organism, um, and it's primarily found in the urinary tract and urine itself, hence urine isn't sterile. We also have, uh, you know, there, there's a whole lot of these organisms. Bacteroids is, is commonly highly abundant in the guts of people who have a typical Western diet. Um, Bifidobacterium is another common probiotic you may have heard of, and that will establish itself in the intestines if the conditions are right. And then we have Micrococcus, and I threw that one up there just because it's cool to say that it hangs out in your armpits. Um, so up to this point, I've only shown you bacteria, which do account for the majority of your microbiome, but we do have other organisms here, um, all, albeit in, in lower abundance. So we have archaea, which are sort of like bacteria, but are uh, distinctly different, and these are mainly going to be methane producers found in your gut. Fungi, which in, in the human microbiome are typically in the form of yeasts, and those will be found in the vagina, the gut, and on the skin. Um, and then we have viruses, which are typically found all over the body, including integrated within our own DNA. And so moving back to the bacterial-centric view of things is one of my favorite slides. 
and it, it essentially serves to highlight how different parts of the body contain distinct microbial organisms. And so, such that from your hair all the way down to your toes, you have different body sites and, and different environmental variables that go into um, what organisms are going to end up where. And that gets to what, what I want to talk about for this next slide, which is what goes into which microbes end up where. So we have two sets of factors, those that are intrinsic and more related to the body, meaning body site is going to be the primary driver here. So what are the moisture conditions? What's the pH? Um, there's immune system inputs, um, as well as age and gender playing a role here. And then we have extrinsic factors, which are going to be more environmentally related. And these things are going to alter the microbes that you have on your skin and, and inside your body. And, and you'll be asking questions like, what is your hygiene? Do you have pets at home? All of these things sort of influence this. But the primary driver, at least within the gut microbiome, is going to be your diet. So what are you eating? Um, so now we know essentially who's there and, and how they got there. But what exactly does our microbiome do for us, right? That's the meat of this, this presentation. Um, and, and this is a list of some of the things our microbes do. It's by no means a comprehensive list, and it's sort of meant to overwhelm you. I don't expect you to read all of these, and, and I wouldn't recommend trying. But there are a ridiculous amount of things that our microbiome does for our health in good ways. Um, some of the more interesting ones are the fact that our microbiomes are capable of altering host gene expression, meaning that they can influence what our genes are doing, which sort of gets at, are we really in control at all times? Um, another uh, really cool one that I mentioned previously was the fact that they protect us from harm by displacing pathogens. Um, and in addition to this, they're capable of metabolizing dietary carcinogens, so taking something that could potentially be harmful to us and breaking it down into things that are benign that we can just kind of pass on. Um, and then they can also give us access to nutrients that we don't have the enzymes or, or the capability of processing. So there's a whole list of these. Um, but what happens when things fall apart? Um, what happens when our microbiomes become disrupted? Um, and when things fall apart, you get this, again, not comprehensive list. It serves to highlight some of the more buzzworthy or notable diseases and disorders that microbiomes have been uh, linked to. So it's important to note that um, for everything on the left, side of the slide, um, a microbiome, a disrupted microbiome has been associated with these diseases and disorders, whereas everything on the right, the microbiome has been uh, shown to be causative, so it has a direct role in promoting this disease. And that leads us into an important distinction in the field, and that's one of association versus causation, where association type studies and experiments are sort of asking who's there, who's not there. We observed microbiome X in a healthy patient and microbiome Y in a diseased patient versus causative-based approaches, which are really trying to get at, can a microbiome cause a disease? So can we take disease-associated microbiome Y and transfer it into a healthy host and induce that disease? Um, and we'll see an example of these later on. Um, so I'll expand on, on a few of these. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk about mental health disorders in the microbiome in the popular press. I'm sure you've all seen the headlines. Um, I think we need to be really cautious with what we're saying here. What we absolutely know is that there's a gut-brain axis where the enteric nervous system is communicating with the brain. We also know that the gut itself communicates with the endocrine system and the immune system. And in addition to that, we've seen that gut microbes can influence both the endocrine and immune system. In addition to that, they can also um, influence and talk to the enteric nervous system. So what we have on this slide essentially is this complex network of communication. And we sort of have to figure out what's going on between these two, uh, or, or between all of this. Um, and so it's sort of promising, right, that we have gut microbes that are involved in all of these communication processes, including sending things to the brain via the enteric nervous system. Um, but, as you can plainly see, this is really complex and it makes it really difficult to study. And so, further complicating this is, is the fact that mental health disorders themselves are inherently complex with a lot of underlying factors. And again, we, we have really promising observ observations and associations with, with these microbiome and mental health disorders, but we do need a lot more research in this area. As for our next topic, I'm sort of just going to grab the low-hanging fruit here um, and, and briefly discuss the connection between cancer and the microbiome. So cancer is going to come in in many forms, and, and even the same forms can vary from patient to patient. Um, the link between microbiomes and cancer is a bit murky. 
However, there are, uh, this is a giant field. A lot of people are looking into this. Um, and as is the case with Helicobacter pylori, which we saw earlier, um, we see a direct role for this bacteria in causing inflammation. And we know that um, if inflammation persists for long periods of time, so if we have chronic inflammation, we have an increased risk of cancer in the patients who have that inflammation. And so it's sort of an association, but many steps before we end up with cancer, we have sort of things laying the groundwork for that to happen. Um, but again, this can differ from patient to patient, and, and cancer is very complex. Um, on the flip side of that, we have discovered direct evidence for bacteria in suppressing tumor growth, which is pretty cool. Um, and animated at the top is just sort of a quick literature search that I did this morning just to give you a small idea of what's out there on this very large um, body of, of research. And while it's not, ex not limited to just these two bacteria, species of Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus, both, uh, both probiotics, um, have been shown to counter inflammation as well as suppress tumor growth. And so these might be potential therapeutics for prevention of chronic inflammation and, and potentially um, can some forms of cancer. So we can next look at the causative side of, of, of things. And that comes with some really brilliant experiments performed in, uh, mount with malnutrition and obesity. These experiments were really straightforward and relatively simple, where essentially researchers took poop from a fat mouse and transferred it into a healthy mouse, and they saw that the healthy mouse ate more, gained weight, and, and ended up headed toward, towards obesity. And years later, and, and sort of a lot of these experiments were going on, another group took some poop from a malnourished mouse and transferred it into a fat mouse, and they sort of saw the opposite, where the fat mouse started eating less and started losing weight, headed towards more of a healthy weight. And again, all kinds of these experiments have, have been performed, and including a, a few times in clinical trials with humans, and also some unintentional side effects where, for instance, we were trying to s treat C. diff colitis, and we unintentionally transferred um, an obese-associated microbiome into this person, and they ended up being treated for their C. diff but had this unintentional side effect of gaining weight due to the microbes that were transferred. Um, and so all of this is really promising. It, it's incredibly difficult to prove that changes in a microbiome or a microbiome itself can actually result in a disease. It, it's what I've essentially spent my dissertation doing, and it's, uh, you can trust me when I say it's a tall task, which sort of brings me to my last group of diseases um, that I wanted to highlight, and that's where my research falls. Um, I work under this umbrella of inflammatory bowel diseases and intestinal disorders, um, some of which you may know, uh, like C. diff uh, at, or Crohn's disease, and others you might not. So I specifically work with Hirschsprung's disease and Hirschsprung's associated enterocolitis. And I'm not really going to go into all the details of these, but suffice it to say that these are diseases that are affecting babies. Um, and uh, with the case of HAC, um, it can sometimes be fatal, and we don't know what causes it. And so we have promising results in both mice and humans that um, have, have tied disruptions in the microbiome to, to the cause of, of, the, of this enterocolitis. So essentially that's it uh, on that side of things. Um, I wanted to finish by, by bringing this back around to Earthrise. And, and I want to remind you of how easy it was to think of the Earth as more than just water and rocks. I hope that what I've shown you today makes it as easy for you to view yourselves and others as more than just water and tissues. You're all super organisms. You're all walking ecosystems. Each and every one of us, every human being who has ever lived, every human I just showed you on this slide. And I think that's an absolutely phenomenal fact. And in my opinion, it's, it's one of the most astounding facts I've ever learned. Um, I'm happy to be doing this research, but I challenge you to wake up every morning and as you look in the mirror, brew your coffee or whatever it is that you do as a part of your morning ritual, remind yourself that you're this marvelous superorganism. Remind yourself that those around you are equally as marvelous. Um, all of us play host to all three branches of life, carrying with us so much complexity, something that goes beyond what we can see with just our eyes. So before I finish, I just want to give a shout out to three people. Um, namely, I've got them on my shirt, I've got them on the slide. My favorite scientist, the reason I'm a scientist, is Carl Sagan. The man was an inspiration. He brought science to everyone. Um, and we need a little more of that in the world. And the last two mentions are going to go to Rachel Watson, who's been a phenomenal teaching mentor. And then to my advisor, Naomi Ward, who's in the audience here who without I couldn't be standing here today. Um, both of these women are incredibly inspiring. 
Um, and they were featured a moment ago, but I wanted to feature them here again because I, I think they really deserve recognition. Um, and I want to thank them both for all of the effort and the support they've sent my way, in addition to all of the things that both of these women are involved in on campus to make the community, to make the scientific community, and everything better. So that's all I got. I'll take anybody's questions. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I didn't talk about how we analyze microbiomes, and then I didn't talk about treatments either. I, I practiced and was way over this time. Um, so if anyone has questions on that, I'll be happy to explain. I'm interested in the treatment aspect because um, we are so complex, and there's so many Uh, so, I mean, the, the current, the only, th so oftentimes it's fecal transfers that we're doing. There's probiotic and prebiotic treatments as well. But um, in the case of C. diff colitis, um, that's generally induced by an antibiotic regimen, and then you end up with this antibiotic-resistant organism that's going to end up killing you. And so, as it currently stands, at least the last I checked, we only have a fecal transfer approved for C. diff. Um, there's promising results for ulcerative colitis and things like that. But the, so the FDA is gonna classify a fecal transfer as a drug, and so it's really hard to get through clinical trials and all of those steps. And so treatments are very difficult, and we end up having people out just getting someone's poop and sort of transferring it in themselves, which is pretty dangerous to do because you don't know what's in there. Um, and so there are a lot of hoops and, and steps to jump through in terms of treatments. Um, but it seems to be that it's promising, right? Um, we're, under, we're starting to understand what's going on when we treat patients with antibiotics and um, whether or not they develop C. diff and, and all that kind of stuff afterwards. So I think it's promising. Yeah. Have you looked at any, like, dietary interventions or, um, like, you, uh, that people, people have access to that can be benefited towards the C. diff? Like I haven't looked extensively into that. I do know um, in the case of, uh, like, the supplement probiotics that you see out in the stores, those aren't regulated by the FDA, and so we don't actually have a definitive idea of what organisms are there. But when it comes to like live culture things like kombucha and yogurts that have live cultures and things like that, I mean, we know those organisms are there. That's how they're created. So, um, I don't know the, uh, the C. diff side of things. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge stigma with, with those diseases, and I, I think if we end up with like a, a, I hate to say real world, but if we have like a practical, tangible mechanism that's going behind these diseases, where it's backed in like hard science, I guess, that sect of people who have that stigma might go, oh, well, there's this mechanism, and this is a real tangible thing. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat? Was the research showing in terms of yogurt that you buy in the store and the probiotic uh, pills that you get from the store, what uh, that have claims? What are, what is, how true are the claims? Yeah, so I mean, it, it, as far as I know, um, there's not an extensive study done on the contents of what's in those. Uh, they're classified as supplements, right? And so essentially you could put sugar in them and put it on the shelf. Um, and you know, there's no way to really know what's in them. I suspect that people probably, at least I'm going to have hope in humanity a little bit and, 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 and hope that they are what they say, but there's no concrete science behind, behind it. As far as yogurts and, and live culture things, I mean, again, like you have to have those organisms in there to make the product. Um, and even sometimes, so they can administer heat-killed probiotics, so, so organisms that aren't actually alive but can actually still exert effects, uh, which is a really interesting little subset of things. Uh, 
Um, I, I almost included a, a graph I found that I had never seen before. I, I wish I would have thrown it in just in prep for a question like this. Um, but just the sheer amount of ingredients that are in a natural, in natural breast milk versus formula, I mean, you have, it's so much more packed in the breast milk versus formula. Um, I think that they can supplement the, the formulas with probiotics and things like that. But I mean, again, we're looking at distilling something down that essentially evolution has crafted to be the thing that we need, right? And when you break it into its components, you don't always end up with everything that, that a child is going to need. I mean, my recommendation would be to breastfeed if possible. Um, I mean, there are cases where it's not possible. But. Yeah, I mean, so it's really hard, right? Because when, when, when I look out at all of you, like basically I just see you, I don't see your microbes. Um, so I think the, the, the understanding, um, and at least the way that um, I came into it, is understanding how many microbes are there and getting just a, a general idea of what it is that they're doing, right? And that's sort of why I paralleled it with the Earth, right? Because everyone can look at the Earth and see well, of course, this is the ecosphere. All the stuff is here. Um, but our bodies are, are just as complex. Um, and so I think it's maybe just getting an outreach, getting into settings like this and teaching people about the microbes that are living, that are living on us. Um, Yeah, so I mean, we, we've all probably read the headlines of the rise in antibiotic resistance in bacteria, which is due to a number of things, overprescription, not taking your prescription for the duration. Um, it, it's funny because in Rachel's microbiology class, people were bringing in like antiseptics and disinfectants, and we're testing them against just lab strain organism. And, and what oftentimes we find is that, you know, the hand sanitizer, sanitizer that's coming out of the dispenser isn't going to kill a whole lot of organisms that you want it to. And in fact, sometimes it can kill the good organisms that are going to protect you from the bad ones. And I think it's sort of, uh, I mean, there's a fine line, right? Because we do want to be clean in terms of like hospitals and things like that. Obviously, with surgeries and things, we need to be very sterile and very clean. That has a whole other host of infections that can come from that. But I, th I think it's kind of dangerous that we have hand, hand sanitizers everywhere. I mean, is it going to create the superbug? Probably not. Um, but it creates an environment where people are scared of the word germ, um, and, and germs are 99% good for you, or, or at least not harmful. So there's two sides of that coin. I think that's it. So thanks, everyone.